Hi everyone, in this video we are going to talk about architecture for apps using Flutter and Firebase. Architecture is not only one of my favorite topics, but also a crucial one if you're building any kind of non-trivial application. So if you've been waiting for me to talk about this in depth, then grab a drink and sit comfortably, because we're gonna take a deep dive. And by the way, this video will be a high level description of a production ready architecture that I'm already using in various projects. But behind the scenes, I have a lot more valuable stuff to share with you. If you head over to my website on this page, you can find a complete written tutorial about architecture. And beyond that, I will share a completely new GitHub project so that you can look at the architecture in very practical terms. And you can find a link to this in the description below. Okay, so let me give you an overview of what we will cover in this video. First of all, we will talk about architecture in general, what it is and why we need it. We will learn about the importance of composition in good architecture, and we will see some of the good things that happen when you do have a good architecture, and some of the bad things that happen when you don't have a good architecture. Then we will focus on architecture for Flutter and Firebase apps, and we will talk about various concepts such as the application layers, unidirectional data flow, mutable and immutable state, and stream-based architecture. Then we will look at some desirable properties that we want in our code, and we will see how everything fits together with some practical examples. And by the way, this video is just the tip of the iceberg, and what I will share with you is the result of over two years of my own work, learning concepts, writing code, and refining it across multiple personal and client projects. So when I say that I'm sharing a production-ready architecture, I don't mean that lightly, and I think you'll find a lot of value in this. And if you're new here, please like and subscribe for more Flutter videos. Okay, so let's get started. And the first question we might have is, what is architecture? I like to think of architecture as the foundation that holds everything together and supports your code base as it grows. And if you have a good foundation, it becomes easier to make changes and add new things. Architecture uses design patterns to solve problems efficiently and you have to choose the design patterns that are most appropriate for the problem that you are trying to solve. For example, an e-commerce application and a chat application will have very different requirements. But regardless of what you're trying to build, it's likely that you'll have a set of problems and you need to break them up into smaller, more manageable ones. You can create basic building blocks for each problem and you can build your app by composing blocks together. In fact, composition is a fundamental principle that is used extensively in Flutter and more widely in software development. And since we are here to build Flutter apps, what kind of building blocks do we need? Well, let's say that you're building a page to do authentication. You will need some input fields and a button, and you need to compose these inputs together to make a form. But the form by itself really doesn't do much. You will also need to talk to an authentication service and the code for that is very different from your UI code. To build this feature, you'll need code for showing the UI and interacting with it, and you'll also need code for input validation and for signing in with your authentication provider. And we can say that the signing page has a good architecture if it's made with well-defined building blocks that we can compose together. And we can take this same approach and scale it up to the entire application. And this has some very clear benefits. For starters, adding new features becomes easier because you can build upon the foundation that you already have, and your code base becomes easier to navigate and understand. In fact, you're likely to spot some recurring patterns and conventions as you read the code. Also, components have clear responsibilities and don't do too many things, and this happens by design if your architecture is highly composable. Not only that, but entire classes of problems go away, and we will talk about that a bit later. Finally, not only you can have independent building blocks, but you can have different kinds of blocks, because you can define separate application layers for different areas of concern. On the other hand, when we don't have a good architecture, we don't really have clear conventions for how the code should be written, and if we don't create composable building blocks, then we end up with code that has a lot of dependencies, and this kind of code is hard to understand and adding new features becomes problematic, because it's not even clear where new code should go. Some other potential issues are also common, so the app could have a lot of mutable state, making it hard to know which widgets rebuild and when. And it's not clear when certain variables can or cannot be null, especially if they are shared or copied across multiple widgets. 
Okay, so now that we know why it's important to have a good architecture, let's take a look at this diagram which shows my architecture for Flutter and Firebase apps. And the first thing that I want to point out are these horizontal lines that define some clear application layers. And I think it's a good idea to always think about application layers, because when you write new code, you should ask yourself, where does this belong? For example, if you're writing some UI code for a new feature, you're likely to be inside a widget class. Maybe you need to call some external web service API when a button is pressed. In this case, you need to stop and think, where does this API code go? And I think that having clear application layers always in mind is very helpful here. And ultimately, this boils down to following the single responsibility principle, which broadly means that each component in your app should do one thing only. So UI code and networking code are two completely different things. They should not belong together and they live in very different places in this diagram. Next, let's talk about unidirectional data flow. And as you can see here, the data flows from the outside world into your services, view models, and all the way down to your widgets. On the other hand, when you need to make calls, you have the opposite flow, where widgets may call into your view models and services, and these in turn may call APIs inside Dart packages. And what is really important about this flow is that components that live on a certain application layer do not know about the existence of components below them. For example, view models do not have any reference to widget objects. And instead, widgets subscribe themselves as listeners while view models publish updates when something changes. And this way of communicating between objects is known as the publish subscribe pattern and it has various implementations in Flutter. For example, if you have been using change notifier or block in your own apps, then you have already used the publish and subscribe pattern. So this sounds good, but how do we connect things together? Well, the answer is the provider package. This is something that I use in every single one of my apps, and I really like the fact that we can use it to enforce an unidirectional data flow with immutable model classes. And this has various benefits that we will discuss later. And by the way, if you want to learn more about provider and how to use it in practice, you can watch my provider video series on YouTube. And just for reference, here is a simplified diagram of the widget tree for the application included in the starter project on GitHub. This should give you a high level understanding of how provider is used in this project. And if you want, you can dive into the code for the starter project to learn more about this. Next, I want to talk about mutable and immutable state. Because one important aspect of this architecture lies in the differences between services and view models. In particular, View models can hold and modify state, while services can't. In other words, we can think of services as pure functional components, and services can transform the data that they receive from external Dart packages and make it available to the rest of the app via domain-specific APIs. For example, when working with Firestore, we can use a wrapper service to do serialization. This takes care of transforming streams of key value pairs from Firestore documents into strongly typed immutable data models. And when we want to write data, it converts the data models back to key value pairs for writing to Firestore. On the other hand, view models contain the business logic for your application and are likely to hold mutable state. This is okay because widgets can be notified of state changes and rebuild themselves according to the publish and subscribe pattern that we have described. And the takeaway here is that by combining unidirectional data flow with the publish subscribe pattern, we can minimize mutable application state along with the problems that often come with it. Next, let's talk about stream-based architecture. Unlike traditional REST APIs, with Firebase we can build real-time apps. That's because Firebase can push updates directly to subscribed clients when something changes. For example, widgets can rebuild themselves when certain Firestore documents or collections are updated. Many Firebase APIs are inherently stream-based. As a result, the simplest way of making our widgets reactive is to use stream builder or stream provider. Of course, if you wanted, you could use change notifier or some other state management techniques that implement observables and listeners but you will need additional glue code if you wanted to convert your input streams into reactive models based on change notifier. 
By the way, streams are the default way of pushing changes not only with Firebase but with many other services as well. So whether you use Firestore or want to get the data from your device's input sensors, streams are the most convenient way of delivering asynchronous data over time. In summary, this architecture defines separate application layers with an unidirectional data flow. Data is read from Firebase via streams and widgets are rebuilt according to the published subscribe pattern. Next, I want to talk about the specific properties that we can expect from code that follows this architecture. So the resulting code is clear, reusable, scalable, testable, performant and maintainable. So let's look at each of these points with some examples. And let's start with clear code. So what I have here is a widget class that represents this page which is used to show a list of jobs. This is made out with a scaffold and an up bar and inside the body I have this stream builder that is used to read some data as a stream from Firestore. And I can pass the snapshot to this list items builder which is a generic widget that I have created for showing a list of items. And this page actually does a number of different things. It shows a list of items and it has callbacks for creating new jobs or deleting existing ones as well as routing to a job details page. And to do these things it needs to talk to a database class or to perform some navigation. And in order to talk to the database class or to do navigation we just need one line of code. And this is possible because this code delegates the actual work to external classes and as a result this code is quite clear and readable. Instead, if you were to implement database code and serialization and routing and UI all in one class, then you would have a much harder time making sense of everything and your code would also be less reusable as a result. And while talking about reusable, I should also show you a different page in this app, which I used to show a daily breakdown of all the jobs along with the pay. And this is implemented in this entries page that you see over here. And one thing that I should point out is that this page reuses some of the same components that I had in the previous page. In fact, here I reuse this list items builder but with a different type. And this time the input stream that we need to build the UI comes from an entries view model rather than the database. But the way in which data flows into the UI is the same as before using stream builder and other reusable widgets. So the point that I'm trying to make is that it really pays off to build reusable components that can be used in multiple places. Next, let's talk about scalable code. And if you have implemented Firestore crude operations before, you're probably familiar with this kind of syntax, where you get a reference to a nested collection in Firestore, and then you manipulate the data in the snapshots stream and read your documents. This can get quite messy, especially if your documents have a lot of key value pairs and you don't want to have code like this inside your widgets or even in your view models. Rather, you can define a domain-specific Firestore API using some service classes and keep things tidy. So here is a Firestore path class that I've created to list all the possible read and write locations in my Firestore database. And alongside this, I have this Firestore database class, which is what I use to provide access to the various documents and collections. In fact, this class exposes all the various crude operations to the rest of the app behind a nice API that uses strongly typed model classes. In fact, all this jobs page needs to do is to pass this input stream to the stream builder and doesn't have to worry about any implementation details. So if I wanted to support a new type of document or collection in Firestore, all I would have to do is to add some additional paths to this file and add the corresponding APIs to this class to support the various operations. And I would also have to create strongly typed model classes that include the serialization code for the new kind of documents that I need to use in the app. But all of this new code would remain confined inside the domain layer of my app and in fact it lives inside this services folder that I have over here. And any widgets that wanted to use the new database APIs could just get access to the database via provider and use it like we have seen over here. 
So all of this database code is easily scalable and I can add new functionality by following repeatable steps and ensure that the code is consistent. This is very valuable if you work in a team. So not only is the code scalable, but it is also testable. And this is true for any unit tests that I write in my code because my classes are small and have few dependencies. But it also applies to widget tests as well because all my widgets have scoped access to the dependencies that they need. And thanks to the provider package, it is easy to swap out my services with mock objects and run tests against them. This leads to widget tests that are fast and predictable because they don't call any networking code. So this is good stuff. And with the right setup, it's even possible to make the entire app testable, as long as we can swap out any services with mock objects at the root of the widget tree. This is particularly useful when running integration tests that can be used to test entire user flows in the app. Next, let's talk about performance. And one great thing about this architecture is that it minimizes widget rebuilds. This is accomplished using provider and stream builder and feature builder as needed. And how do we do this? Well, once we read some state or data asynchronously from an external service, we can make that available synchronously to all descendant widgets. For example, this app requires users to sign in with Firebase and our code returns either the home page or the sign page depending on the authentication status of the user. And once a known null user is extracted from the snapshot, it can be made available synchronously to all descendant widgets. For example, this is the build method of the account page that is only shown if the user is signed in, and it is very easy to get the user with provider. Now, if we didn't have an ancestor provider of type user, how would we get the user object? Well, most likely we would write something like this. We would have to create a future builder so that we can get the current user asynchronously, even though we have already obtained it in one of the ancestor widgets. And then we would have to define a builder with some more boilerplate code to show some loading indicator until this future returns. Instead, provider can solve this problem for us and we should use it to our advantage. So the bottom line is that we can use provider to minimize widget rebuilds, avoid any unnecessary API calls to Firebase and reduce boilerplate code. Finally, I want to talk about maintainability. This architecture leads to maintainable code and the examples that we have seen should be good evidence of this. And at the end of the day, maintainable code will save you and your team days, weeks and months of extra effort. And beyond that, your code will be much nicer to work with and you sleep better at night. Okay, so we have covered a lot of different concepts and it's now time to do a wrap up. And if there is just one message that I'd like you to take home, is that it's really worth it to invest in good architecture. If you're starting a new project, consider planning out your architecture up front based on your requirements. And if you're struggling with a code base that doesn't follow good software design principles, start refactoring in small iterations. You don't have to fix everything at once, but it helps to move slowly towards your desired architecture. And if you're building a project with Flutter and Firebase or any other kind of streaming APIs, do check out my starter project on GitHub. This is a complete time tracking application and the README is a good place to get more familiar with all the concepts that we have covered. After that, you can take a look at the source code and try to run the project as well to get a real understanding of how everything fits together. And if you want to learn all these principles more in depth and build this time tracking application from scratch, then there's no better place than my Flutter and Firebase course. With over 20 hours of content, it covers everything that you need to know from the basics of the Dart language all the way to more advanced topics. And by the end of this course, you will have built a production ready app for iOS and Android. And you can always get the course for a discounted price if you follow the link that you can find on my website over here. Thank you very much for following this tutorial. If you end up using this architecture and if it works for you and your projects, I would love to hear your feedback. So if this has helped you, please like and subscribe and I'll see you on the next video.